Here's our entire interview with H. Jack Williams. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music. Uh, and it made, I, I thought of this it, three tracks in. I, I, I remember, you know, I used to write in my journal and I'd write all this stuff. And I didn't understand my family till I went to someone else's house because everyone, when they're young, thinks their family or their uncle or their whatever, the closed unit is completely normal. Oh, at what point consciously when you were young, did you realize whether it was, family, I don't know, what, what, whatever it was, like I got the pissing on your grave thing in the lyric. Um, but at what point did you know maybe my life's a little different than other people's? Probably when my dad beat me up with a garden hose till I bled. Yeah, that didn't happen. You know, I mean, I lived, next door. I lived in a trailer park in Miami. Um, and those and those years that that stuff was happening. And um, so that window right there, let's pretend my bedroom, I grew up in a I grew up in a 44 foot trailer. So my bedroom was this was half the size of my studio. So my bedroom was like from there to there. And there was a window right there. And that window faced Tommy Wolford's house. His bedroom window was right there. And then my other Mike Fox's bedroom window was out there and his trailer was right there. And then there was somebody else's trailer. And so when my dad beat me, everybody could hear me screaming all over the trailer park. And I think, um, you know, that's when I, and, and, you know, when they would get together and they would want to, I mean, at one time they wanted to kill him, you know, and, and I had to stop that. But um, uh, that's when I realized that something wasn't right, but there was, you know, when you're when you're a kid it's not like now now you i can go yeah well that wasn't right you know but that back then you don't really look you don't really go uh this isn't right you just take it and then when you can't take it you're gone when did you leave home how old were you the first time late 14 the first time i ran away from home was late 14 and then I came back, they brought me back, and then uh, two or three times when I was 15, and then um, one big time when I was 16, and that was it. Then I came home and I stayed home until I went in the Marines. I went in the Marines on my 17th birthday, thinking that that, that would help. That would make maybe change his attitude on me. Mm -hmm. You know, when I hear something that speaks so honestly and it gets to me, makes me feel like, oh, yeah, uh, get me down. You, you open it up. I mean, the sequence of this album, by the way, is sequencing on this album. The songs are great. I mean, I love the way you end it, you know, that, 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 that tune that builds with the guitar solo in the middle. It was great. But get me down. Again, that, what I wrote here is what I just told you a while ago. A powerful rocker. Uh, you know, I grew up, I'm 61. I grew up with albums that every time... I would listen to an album in the seventies that the first song was like just a kick-ass rocker, which this was. Tell me about that one. That was probably the, um, that would have been the first song that we co-wrote on this record. Cause I wrote the very first song I wrote on this record was running, running on. I wrote that by myself and um, I started about bit mostly, but when we pulled in Heidi, Heidi Newfield co-wrote that with Adam and I, and um, and that's exactly what it's supposed to be. And I was supposed to be, we were going to, um, at the, uh, where the little bridgey thing was, we were going to do this um, kind of um, mm, demonic, or no, no, not demonic, that's the wrong word. Um, like, a, what's the word? I'm, uh, you know how the old preachers, whoa, and all that singing. We were going to do a little bit of that there, but then we changed our mind. We were going to do this um, praise the Lord in, so, in sort of an um, old-fashioned uh, old fashioned way, but we decided we didn't want to do it. But it was just, you know, it was about trying to get some salvation, uh, yeah. which, is, which is what I usually, I, I usually tend to lean to uh, trying to get that in some of my songs. But that was, that, that was what that was for. But I love what Adam did, the produ my producer, Adam Box. He's the one that came up with that little Beatlesque. Um, you know the beginning of it the 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 ooze and um that's what i love that that was so cool that was all him you know 
Was the word charismatic you're looking for? Was it wasn't charismatic? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I, I, yeah, I've had experiences there too. Uh, better off dead. I love "Ain't No Redemption for the Sinful Man," and there's and there's that's a common theme in here of going. I've gone through this. Will I, you know, will I see the light? Will I learn the lesson? Will I get redemption? Will I go to heaven? There's that. There's those steps throughout the album, and and, uh, and it's uh, anyway. Tell me about that too. Another one. Tommy Connors, Adam and I wrote that. Tommy and I wrote the just the main part of it. And it, again, it was, um, I made a comment. I just made a comment about, we were talking about people like my dad and no, no, I know what it was. It wasn't my dad. It was right at the time where, um, where are you from? Uh, where are you at right now? Where do you live? I'm in Moncton, New Brunswick, Eastern Canada, okay. right above, right well, above Maine. Well, a couple of years ago down here, we had a horrific, um, we had a horrific uh, murder of a little girl. Um, it was on the news. It was on world news. And anyway, this, the parents, the father had done it. And um and when they went, the, it was just, when they showed the court thing we just happened to be here and when and we were talking about it and when they showed the court thing um the, the parents the rest of the family were being held back from getting to him because he was on the stand and and i made a comment i made a comment i said he's just better off dead you know i mean and, and that's and then we just started talking about how some people are just better off dead and uh, that's where that song came from i mean if you're some people are just better off dead <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, when they're that evil, when they're that evil. Yeah. I, I think many, 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 many would agree with you. Uh, Beat me again. Um, you know, it's another song, but those bruises all faded, but the scars that remain as I plunge these memories deep into my veins, like that is such a great, powerful lyric. Uh, credit that to W Earl Brown the director and co-writer on that. You know who that is, right? The actor? Uh, I don't think so. I don't know. Did I probably know him by face. Did you see a show called Deadwood? Yeah. Dan? I've never seen the show, but I know Deadwood, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, he was Dan in Deadwood. He was also the coach in Draft Day. He was also in Something About Mary. If you Google W. Earl Brown, you'll immediately see what he looks like, and then you'll go, yeah, I've seen him before. Well, he's also a great songwriter. And we wrote that song together, and how that song came about really was uh, we were sitting, I, would, I, I went out to LA to meet with him and see Kevin and, um, and do some work out there. And we were sitting over lunch and, and Earl said, well, tell me, tell me your story briefly. And I did, and we went back to his house and we, he wrote, he just started typing, you know, and because I told him, well, this happened and then this happened and, and then I got on drugs and then this happened and then this happened and this happened and, and we wrote it all out and that's what became of that. I actually went to Kevin's, I'm talking about Costner, I actually went to his house that night to finish the song and, and I was at the dinner table with him and his wife and I say, you'll never believe what W. Earl did. I said, I mean, check this out. And I played it to him and, 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 his, and, and Kevin's wife was like, he got all that from one, <laughs> just me, you know, I went, yeah. Yeah, so that's what that's all. And there's a great video now. We've got a video. I don't know if you've seen the video. That's out now. It's really, I mean, he directed that video and it's it's a duet. The same girl is singing the, on the album with me, Brandy Zidane, but it's, uh, we wanted to do this because this is, I wanted to do this for child abuse. I wanted to, I wanted to make a statement, you know, and, and so we, we did this video and hopefully, hopefully it'll land somewhere where it can do some good. It's just getting started, of course, but hopefully it will. You two sound great together on that song. Great together. It's like the angel and the, it's like the princess and the toad. <laughs> but see, that's a, that's always been my favorite pairing. You, I don't want two people who sound exactly the same. I just always like that duality because mm-hmm. it really works. It does. It does. It does. Cause she's so great. Yeah. 
Well, it's like an album that's produced so well. And by the way, this album is so well produced. The sound quality of it in my little Mac here, listening to it. I mean, when I listen to it, and I always listen to it on small speakers first, and it sounds amazing. Really nicely done. Thank you. In what capacity do you work? We'll come back to the song in a sec. The songs uh, with Molly Hatchet. Did you you help co-write songs or? No, no. I just back in those days it was when I was writing songs with Uriah Heep, and I came out of that, and I started hanging out with you know uh, Ronnie Van Zant and Alan Collins and and uh, Gary Rosington, and we became really really good friends and through all that my songs just got you know they just would get around and somehow or other keep on riding ended up in the molly hatchet camp and i never i didn't even know that they had done it i didn't even know that uh, they had done that until i i got a copy of it and um but it was a great little version that they did of, that they did of it you know the the uh, you, well we talked about two tragic things there skinnered and, you know, the tragedy in that, but also Molly Hatchet. I mean, basically one lead singer after another. I mean, I remember with their first couple of albums, you know, Danny Joe Brown, just loving the fact that, just loving how he resonated and his voice. But, and then Jimmy and then Phil, they're like all, you know, when I did, I did a, a, a um, an obituary for each one of those guys. And I remember going, it's rock and roll. Some of it's lifestyle, a lot of it's lifestyle sometimes, you know, again, getting back to, Half my family always says, I can't believe I'm still here, you know, because I know that. I know all Gary Rosington and I, we go back um, to way back. We would go back, back to uh, before Nebworth, so it would have been 75. But I can, but, but without going into any detail, we, we've done a lot of stuff, you know, I mean, <laughs> crazy stuff. I mean, riding on a I remember riding on a jet boat. He had just got a jet boat. Him and Alan had just got jet boats. And we were on the St. John's River. And I remember, I can remember that he was driving, looking up in the air. And he said, look, and we were following uh, seagulls. And he was, let's follow that seagull. We ended up in the ditch, you know, and I mean, <laughs> We ended up on shore, I mean, doing 60 miles an hour. But we were talking just not too long ago, we were talking because he just had a birthday last week. He's uh, he's two weeks older than I am, so to speak. And and we were talking and, and he said, you know, I don't know how we're still here. You know, really? I mean, because I look back at some of the stuff that we did back in those days and I don't know how we, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, even in Nashville here, even when, the, even, even in the heyday in Nashville in the 80s, when I was running with Jim Varney and, and Menor Williams and Larry Henley and all that, we were running, we were running hard. And I can remember leaving the bars at three o'clock in the morning and I do not know. <laughs> to this day, I don't know how, why I'm even here because I can look back and I, of course, I don't do that anymore. And it's nothing to be proud of, but at the same time, I mean, I had an angel sitting on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. There, wh what are you, you know, and I've talked to a lot of, I mean, you know, Caleb Quay, Elton John's guitarist in the beginning and in the seventies, he tells me the same kind of stories where for what was the catalyst for you or the probably were many for you still to be here what was it that got you to a point where you said well i got to do something here like what was it what do you mean to get clean to to be to you know to 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 not put oh, yourself probably in... um well it just got to a point where i was never i was never like some of my friends i mean i'm don't need to mention no names, but I was never like some of my friends that uh, I had to get up in the morning and I had to drink a bottle of whatever and do a eight ball of whatever to get going. I was never there, but um, I did, you know, I did my share at night, but what got me to, I think, I think I got to a point where I couldn't create well. And that, and, and then I remember I was with a publisher. I remember a publisher sat me down. It was here in Nashville. And um, I remember him sitting me down and going, well, 
you know, you're really just turning it in crap now. And I mean, and it's your, you know, you're not doing yourself any good. And if you really want to be something, and if you really want to do something, um, then you need to kind of straighten up and quit partying and, and put your emphasis on, you know, doing this and, 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 you know, and then I saw people, then people were dying, you know, and then, and then it got to be at a point where people were, well, people, uh, well, I still know people at my age now that do cocaine. And I go, I, I, mean, I haven't seen that in years and years, but I mean, I, I, I wouldn't even, I'd be afraid my heart would blow up, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know why people still do the, what they do, but I know I couldn't, I'm married, I've got a family. Um, I don't ever think about doing stuff like that now because I, I wanna, I still haven't got where I wanna go. Don't know if I'll ever get there yet, but I'm still not there. This is the only, way to, the only way to get there. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, the, only no, you way to get, the only way to get there is to keep putting one foot in front of the other and keep trying and hope that I get there before I die, you know? You know, the, the, uh, uh, most of the rockers that I talk to, of course, as you can imagine, have at least 10 years on me, almost everyone. And because of that, and I'm being 61, I'm looking at the clock, I'm watching it, I'm going... And I tell all of them what I'm going to tell you. There's a, there's a, you know, and I've gone through that as well, but I look at this and I'm going, why isn't it interesting? I'm 61. I've been in radio 38 years and I'm only now doing the best work I've ever done Yeah. because, you know, but you know, and I look at you and I'm going, there you go. I, I am shocked. You know, I mean, this year, the end of this year, I landed the biggest publishing deal I've ever had in my career. And believe me, I've had some big ones. I've landed a distribution deal. I've la I'm with a manager that manages Lucas Nelson. And, and I'm hoping, and it looks like I'm gonna go out and do some dates next year, which is something I always wanted to do. And, it, and it's like, I jokingly say, God, why couldn't you have done this when I was 30 and had more energy? <laughs> I mean, it's like, why did you wait this long? But it's a funny story that I tell. I know everybody likes my Richie Haven stories, and this is a true one. Um, Richie and I were really, really close friends and um, best of friends, like brothers. And uh, he was heavily in astrology and all that stuff, you know, and he did my chart. I was about, uh, it was about 1973. He did my chart and um, the long and short of it, he said, I got good news and I got bad news. And I said, well, what's the good news? He said, the good news is you're gonna be extremely successful. Be on your wildest dreams. I said, cool. He said, the bad news, it's not gonna happen till very late in life. So you're gonna to have to hang in there. And here it is. And here it is, it's coming now. You know, it's starting to come now. And it's like, Okay, all right, this is interesting that this was, you know. Um, so that's, you know, I've got to try to try to keep making this happen, you know. I wrote, remember the man that you knew, the beautiful, beautiful song. Anyone who's honest about their journey has said that somehow or thought that in various words to someone they loved, you know. Tell me about that one. Oh, that's really special. That's one of my most special songs in the record. Um, my Beautiful. studio is right. My studio is right here. My son's bedroom is right there. He's a he's going to be eighteen next Monday, and he's a he's a senior, and he's a totally different than me. He's he's a well rounded A student. Um, doesn't have a violent bone in his body. Doesn't have doesn't have anything like that. There's nothing like me, and. Um, and I sat here one day and uh, he was over there, the door was closed and I started that song and I, I said to myself, well, you know, <clears throat> one day when I'm gone, you're gonna hear some stuff, probably. I mean, I, then I wanted to exaggerate because I do like to write, my, my main goal is to write for film and TV. So I had to do a little, take a little creative license and, and take it a little bit further than it should have. But it basically, it was basically that, it was basically, you know, when I do die, you know, and, and, if, and if you hear somebody say, man, you know, when he was younger, he died, or, you know, he did this or he did that. 
or like any take any bad guy and i put myself like like what what if um al capone had a kid you know i've done some history on all those guys he had a kid so what if wonder if you know he said that to his kid just remember the man that you knew you know don't worry about what they say remember what we have what we have you just remember what we have and all the rest of it will just fall by the wayside and that's what that was about yeah one of my favorites on the album a few favorites but um and and dead or alive is another one you know that that kind of living on the edge I like grittiness in a song. I like something that pushes me a little bit. And, and again, the theme of the album. Uh, tell me about that one. Dead or Alive? Yeah. Dead or Alive was leaving Dade County. That's Dade County is Miami. And that was leaving Dade County, running away. That's what that was. It was a story of running away. You know, that was just thinking about running, leaving Dade County. Uh, my, a bounty, you know, I'm going to make, you know, they want me dead or alive. You know, my dad, he was doing, he, he, we had a, he had a connections to the police department and, you know, I mean, they, they brought me home a couple of times, but that's what that one was about. Were there ever words? I mean, my dad was a rough and tumble guy and he died at 87, maybe five years ago. And, you know, I, I remember just, I'll share this with you. I remember, we used to woodcutters We're underneath the truck one day it was too hot, big truck. So we're underneath the truck. And at one point he looks at me and, you know, he was, he was really rough. He looks at me, gave me a look. And I remember going, that's as much as I'm ever going to get as I love you and thank you. But no words were spoken. You and your dad, did you ever get it? Did you just have to get away? Were there no resolving anything with him? I went back one time just before he died. Yeah. I asked him, uh, what did he, what did he, uh, why did he do what he did? And he mm -hmm. went, I didn't do nothing. It's on your head and i went and he wasn't senile i mean he, he was all there and um and i went what do you mean you didn't do nothing and and uh my wife was with me and i and and he's we, i said man you you don't remember cutting that garden hose off and doing you're crazy i would have never done nothing and then my mom came around in the kitchen and she said why are you telling these lies to your father and she was part of it all too she did it all too so and i was like looking at the both of them going well, this is never going to get resolved, yeah. so it never did. Too Busted Up to Mend is one of my favorite tracks off the album. I don't know, that, that song just resonated with me. Tell me about that one. I wanted to give the heart personality. You know what I mean? I wanted the heart to talk to the guy. Like, the heart was a, another person. Yeah. Hey, old friend, it's me again. Your broken heart. You know, it's me. And not the heart's talking to the guy saying, what? Why do you keep doing this shit and getting me in trouble? You know, I mean, it's basically a little conversation between the heart and the guy. And I just thought that that's, that's how we wanted it to be. It was just, um, um, you know, stop doing what you're doing because you don't, you're, every time you do it, um, it, and I'm too busted up to men now. I mean, I'm, you know, but stop before you, you know, but that's what that was. It was a... <laughs> I like that. I like, I like to do that sometimes. I like to give something that has no, you know, give this microphone a personality and have this mic talk to me and say, what are you yelling at me for? You know, whatever. But, you know, I like to do those kinds of songs. One More Day, Kevin Costner co-wrote it My with you. My favorite song. Prettiest song on the album. Uh, uh, tell me about that one. I don't know if it's the prettiest song on the album, but it's my favorite. Well, it has more of a, I think it has more of a pop, not pop, but it, it, it's more popular sounding, I think, than some of the other ones. The other ones are like rock, out rockers and, you know, they've got elements of blues and, and folk and all the stuff you've done in your past, right? Uh, but what about that one? That was just me saying, well, when I get to the end of the road, and... I was thinking again of TJ, but I, a lot of the songs I've written, he's been here when I, in his room when I've been here. So I was just thinking about that, and I was just, what well, what if you could, what if you could get up there and you were, in, in, and you met him, and, and hey, can I have one more day, just one more day, just to clear up a few more loose ends, you know? When Kevin Kevin co-wrote it with me too, and and um, when he does it, because he'll do it live with his band, and when he does it. He does it to the first verse and the, the first two 
the first half of the song, he does it to where, will you uh, give my friend one more day? Speaking about whoever the friend might be. And then at the very last, in the chorus, last one, then it's, and by the way, if you get it, maybe me too. And that song is the demo, is, is the next video we're gonna do. And we got Gary Rosington, he played on that song. And, um, and so we've got video of him playing on that song. So when we do the new video, the next video, we're gonna have um, we're gonna have him involved in the video. He'll be playing on the video, which is gonna be really cool. Uh, speaking of Kevin Costner, Love Shine. Um, yeah, you know what? Was I was I, pardon my ignorance, but I wasn't familiar with that song. I listened to it; it's a beautiful song. I mean, I've heard Kevin sing before. And uh, tell me about that song. I had. Um, that was early in my relationship with Kevin. A um, couple years into it, I probably, and uh, ended up out at his house for something. And he asked me if I would do him a favor. And I said, sure. And he said, um, you know, I've had my band together for 15 years and they've been loyal to me and they've been this and they've been that. And he said, but I've always, I've never heard any song that we've ever done on the radio. And he said, can you help me get a song on the radio? And I, without even batting an eye, I said, sure. And then, you know, he said, well, what's that gonna entail? Yeah, and, I, and, and then we started talking about that. And he, you know, he started telling me what he could do and what he couldn't do because he's in the movies and blah, blah, blah. And then I said, well, what we do need is we need a radio song. And I said, and, and I haven't heard anything on any of your records that leans toward that so much. And I'm, you know, because that was part of my life, writing radio kind of music. So, so we said, we'll write it. So his guitar player and producer, Teddy Morgan and I, we sat down and we wrote it and then, then recorded it and then produced it. Then it, Teddy produced it and um, they did it. And then we, then we ran, I got radio promotion people and we ran with it and got it um, on up to number 26 on the secondary radio charts and stopped there, you know, and, but he got his, he got his dream come true. You know, I mean, I made it happen for him. Again, being a radio guy, there's this thing that we need to do. When we go backstage with someone, we can't be a fan. When we, uh, uh, if we ever get invited to someone's place because somehow you reviewed something or else, you know, they like the way you interview them or whatever, and they, or else they find a kinship with you somehow. It's rare, but it happens. We have to go there and we have to be cool. We can't be, oh, I remember that time. And um, let with Kevin Costner is a great example of that. Okay, how did you meet him, and did did you have to constrain yourself and go, or or is that stuff not, or you don't get starstruck by someone like that? What I made a back when I started out doing this, and I was just getting going. Richie, one of the things that Richie taught me, he said, "Well, you've got to figure out what you're a songwriter." You're an artist songwriter. What route are you going to take to try to, to try to get successful? Are you going to take the route of going after a big publishing deal and trying to be a staff writer? Are you going to take the route of blah, blah, blah? And I decided that after meeting Richie, after meeting Roger Daltrey, after meeting Ken Hensley, and finding that that wasn't so hard, it took a little effort, of course, and it took some, you know, it took some perseverance, but it still, it still came pretty easy. And then I found myself in a very good comfort zone with these people. I figured out right then and there that my, my, my road was always going to be with the artist. So whenever I've decided I wanted to do something, well, I want to meet that guy and, and I've gone after it. So with Kevin, I said to Kathy, my wife, about, you know, whenever it was, eight years, nine years ago, I said, I want to, I want to work with Kevin Costner. Okay. And so I started going after it and those walls were big and those, those red flags were big. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. And then finally, I happened to know something triggered and I happened to notice that he had a band and I didn't know that he had a band. And so then I looked up the band and after I looked at the band, I saw that two of the band members lived here in Nashville and they both had on the website, they both had 
you know, um, where they worked and uh, what studios they worked out of. And so I went, any, any, money, mo, and I picked one and I went, I introduced myself with my bio and, and said, you know, I'd like to meet you. So we did. <clears throat> then when he met me, he said, what do you really want? I said, I want to meet and work with Kevin. He said, okay. He said, but you know, you'll have to work with us first because Kevin, Kevin doesn't do any outside material. He does stuff that the band writes. Oh, fine. So the very first song that we wrote was the song called Heaven So Far Away, which is off of, oh, I forget what's the name of the album he's off of, but it was a song and we sent it to Kevin. Kevin went nuts. He really loved it, recorded it. And then flash forward to about eight months, nine months later, um, Kevin did a little mini tour with his band, uh, um, Knoxville, Fort Myers, a uh, little place outside of Atlanta. And um, on the Knoxville date, which is about three hours from here, Teddy said he wanted to drive there. He wasn't gonna ride the bus. He wanted to drive there and he wanted to get back home because his wife was pregnant with twins at that time. And he said, why don't you come with me? So I did. And that's where I met Kevin. And Kevin and everybody was taking a nap and I was walking around out in the parking lot talking to my wife on the phone. And um, his assistant came out and asked me, said, Kevin wants to talk to you. And that's when I met Kevin and, and we, just, we just hit it off. Um, and that's the way it's always been. It's always been, a I don't know, it's just been like, it's been a great relationship because we, we really have this great bond between the two of us. It's honest and mm -hmm. I've always been honest with him when he's asked me a question about what I thought about something, whether or not I thought it was gonna piss him off or not, I told him the truth. And he's always like that because he doesn't have a lot of people around him to do that, you know? With uh, with Richie Havens, when did you meet him? Because you said you, you you mentioned seventy three a while ago, which was a few years after Woodstock. Did you know him before or after Woodstock? No, I met him at, after. I met him in it was right in during seventy three. Um, he was playing in Atlanta, and that's a funny story that I always tell everybody that you know everybody likes this little story. I mean, that was when I first getting started. Um. Yeah, I was beginning. That was the very beginning of it. Um, I, I was backstage. I had become really good friends with a big promoter in Atlanta. His name was Alex Cooley, was Alex Cooley. And he was the biggest promoter in the Southeast. And Alex really was, a, he liked my songwriting. He liked me. And he, so he gave me this forever back time, back, backstage pass. I could go to any show I wanted to do because he knew I had good manners and good backstage etiquette. And I wasn't going to crawl all over somebody and I wasn't going to do something stupid. And so I met Richie and I told Richie that I wanted to play him some songs. And he said, well, I'm staying at the da 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 and come all by, see me after the show. And so I did. And I got there about, you know, 1130 and, um, and I knocked on his door and there was no answer. And then it was 12 and I knocked, I could hear music. So I knew he was up and I knocked on it. It was about 2.30, quarter to three. I kept knocking, I kept knocking. I sat down, kept knocking. I never, I never gave up about three o'clock in the morning. He opened the door and he said, boy, you've got some perseverance. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> and, I, and that was it. We became best of friends. You know, it was like we uh, we did a lot. He, he, he became my manager. He became a publisher. I went on tour with him a few times. Uh, it was a great relationship. He taught me how to be an artist. He taught me he taught me a lot. He was my mentor and good friend. Did you ever ask him about Woodstock? I mean, he was the first guy up there. Yeah, 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 but it was always, it was a cool thing, you know, it was a great thing we did, you know. Yeah, moment uh, in time. You really, did you really bring, the, did you really make the, did you really always, uh, did you really make the sun come out? He said, well, it came out, whether I made it come out or not, who knows. <laughs> that I, we didn't get to say earlier, I did want to say something, I don't know if you knew this or not, but on Better Off Dead, all those guitar players, those two guitar, that's, that's Gary, Brosington and Ricky Medlock from Leonard Skinner playing the guitars on that. I don't know if you got the liner notes on that, but that's those the, that on that song right there. All the guitars, you hear all those great solos and all those great things that you hear going on in that song. That's Ricky Medlock and Gary Rosington from Leonard Skinner. They did me a favor and came and played on my record. The cover, uh, what a wonderful world. By the way, I used to close my show with that. That. I went from that to uh, the Beatles, Ringo's uh, uh, Good Night, um, but mostly What a Wonderful World. Um, uh, tell me about, the, it, 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 I like the video, it, 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 I get it. 
Tell me about choosing that. You no, know, we did that video. That <clears throat> my publisher wanted me to do a cover of Wonderful World. So we did that. We did the, that was separate. Then Adam said, and this was remember, this is we did this on the on the heels of the election. This was right when America was, you know, they they had stormed the excuse me, they had stormed the Capitol. Um the world was upside down. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking we were getting ready to go into a civil war. I really was scared. I thought, you know, I really thought that, you know, I thought I was gonna have to watch my kid go to war. I, I was just, I was, I, I, you know, all my friends were buying ammunition and it was getting pretty scary, you know? And so we did that. And that's what that was all about. Is it, it was like, a, it's a wonderful world. Really? Is it really? yeah really yeah and then we end it of course it is but um that's what that was all about yeah um uh i'm glad you did it because on some level i would i would you know with these songs i i thought oh he did that and i hadn't heard it yet and let and me then say when I, something go ahead um, who does the guitar on road to hell jerry mcneely yeah. one of the biggest guitar players here and that's a separate road to hell is um a song that Jim Moose Brown, he wrote, it's five o'clock somewhere. And um, he's also was Bob Seger's band leader for the last 20 years, keyboard player. Him and I and Kevin wrote Road to Hell and Moose produced, that's the only one on the record that Adam didn't produce. Moose produced that because we we wanted it to be a like a, like a funeral for a friend or like a stairway to heaven. We wanted it to have that kind of thing to it. Not that it would probably ever see the light of day, but at least I got to do that, you know. No, it does have that funeral for a friend, sort of, yeah, that grand, you know, that uh, I love that. And and then you slow it down. I just, hey, noticed it, liked it. Running on, uh, what's in your heart sticks with you everywhere you go. Ain't that the truth, eh? Mm -hmm. You take it with you wherever you go. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that too. That was the first song. That was the first song. That was when COVID first hit. And I, um, when COVID first hit, you know, and the, and the lockdown went boom and everybody was locked down. I found myself on the couch watching Netflix for the first <laughs> month and a half. I mean, seriously, I think I wore Netflix out and everyone was just laying on the couch watching TV, just, oh, no, watching every movie I could watch. And, and then finally I said, man, I just cannot keep doing this. And I came in the studio and, and that's the first song I wrote for the record. And that's that's when we said, let's do another, let's do a record now. Let's do a real one. And let's take COVID. Let's whatever, however long this takes, let's take this time to to do it. Peter Gabriel gave her some uh, really good advice way back when. I know. Perseverance. He Don't showed that. Up. He's shown that a few times himself. Yeah. Yeah, you can't give up, you know. I gosh. If I had stopped, and I was done, actually. I was done. Uh, probably two years ago, three years ago, two and a half, three years ago, I figured that I had done everything that I was going to do. I didn't think that there was any more new frontier. And then I started singing. And somewhere along the line, somebody liked that. I'm still not sure why, <laughs> but... Um, I like that they do, and I like that I'm getting to do that. I do like doing that. I, I like, I like writing songs now and singing them myself. Richie always wanted me to do that from the very beginning. And if I had, I wonder, I wonder what would have happened if I had listened to him and done that from the very beginning. He thought that that's what I should do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I didn't. I went well, the route of writing songs and hiring gunslinger singers to sing them. The uh, what what point what year was that when was that during Genesis years or was it past the mid seventies when he went? No, it was early seventies. I had a band in New York, mid seventies. I had a band in New York just before I met the Who. Um, we had a band called the Raven, and it was doing really good. We played the Bottom Line. We played all. I mean, I had a, you know, it was it was good. It was like, it was it was my music, you know, and I was. But I was young and stupid. You know, I did some stupid things and got, got myself in trouble here and there. And 
never took it seriously. I mean, if I had, you know, I wish I had known what we know now, but you know, I mean, now I won't screw up if, the, if that comes my way. What were the circumstances to you, to, to you meeting him? Meeting who? A uh, Peter Gabriel. Again, that was the very first person I ever met in the business, ever. I went to a Genesis show, Genesis show backstage and I had two sets of lyrics and he happened to come walking by and I asked him if he had a minute and he said, yeah. And, and I asked him and he took a look and he read them. And then he looked at me and he went, what are you asking me? And I said, do you think, you know, what do you think of my songs? He said, well, this isn't a song. This is a poem. And I went, oh, he said, a song is music and words. This is words. He said, you play guitar or anything? I said, yeah, I play guitar. He said, well, put this to music. And I said, okay. And so then he said, um, and I said, what, what, what's your best advice you can give me? And, and, and he said, perseverance. Perseverance is the name of the game because it's going to be a long, 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 long road. So prepare yourself for a long and lonely road if this is what you want to do. I made my decision then and there. That's what I wanted to do. And it's been a long and lonely road. <laughs> he wasn't kidding. But I wish a lot of people would have, you know, it, it depends upon the messenger, of course. Some people could have told me that. If Peter Gabriel told me that, I think maybe I'd listen a little because it was just something about, even back then. Because back then they hadn't really reached and they didn't become really popular till I remember that's that that New York trip they took and and they were trying to break the band like selling England by the pound time. Mm -hmm. um, but but it came much later for them and, and they proved it. Right. What about Roger Daltrey? What about I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, ask you about that. Uh, how did you meet? How did how did that happen? Same thing. Same thing. I, um, Atlanta. I, Atlanta was where I kind of like, and I was a chef. Well, not a, not at the time I wasn't a head chef, but I was a sous chef at the time. And I always cooked from early days. I, that was my, my other, that's how I kept myself alive was I, I, I got, I was a good, good cook. And I, and I got into working my way up and learning how to be a chef and, 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 and really being tra highly trained. I mean, I'm actually a, I was at one time a three-star uh, saucier, um, a scoffier trained saucier, for lack of a better word. But I was working as a, um, a sous chef in the Abbey Abbey Restaurant. It's still in still in Atlanta, and I was on my way to work. I was at a, my my daughter. My daughter was like six months old. Um, I had my chef. My chef's hat was in the seat next to me. I was on my way to work and went by this big hotel. And there was a whole bunch of guys outside with blue tour jackets on. And I slowed down and I saw it said the who on the back of it. So I just pulled in and just happened to have a new three song demo that I had just done. And um, I walked up to the first guy I saw and I asked him, I said, what's the chances of meeting Roger Daltrey? And he said, slim and none. And I said, okay, thanks. And I turned around and walked away and he went, wait a minute. He said, what do you want to meet him for? And I went, I'm a songwriter. He said, well, wait, wait, wait. Roger loves songwriters. So he called Roger and Roger was um, busy. And Roger said, um, get him a room. Have him hang out. Well, I'll catch up with him later. So that room ended up being the whole tour. And I finally met Roger on the last night. Of the, I never met Roger or Pete. Only met Doug, who was Roger's right hand. And we are the best of friends to this day. We're like blood brothers. He lives in England. And um, Bill Kerbersley was their manager and still is. And um, I met Bill, of course, and Jackie, and um, they took me everywhere. 
I was like the songwriter was following the band all the way around until Roger and Pete decided that on the very last night of the tour, I hadn't even seen the band. I never went out front. I stayed backstage and in my room and during all the parties, um, everything. I was part of the entourage until the very last night of that tour. And um, Roger wants to see you now. <laughs> so I grabbed my guitar. I walked in the room and Roger was sitting there. Pete was sitting there. And six of probably the most beautiful women in the world were sitting in there. And <clears throat> Bill and Jackie. Well, play what you got. <laughs> no nerves at all, yeah. <laughs> and they already had it planned out. They gave me a contract, signed me up for a year, and Pete was going to mentor me, and um, and he did. And uh, that was that. That's how I got my start. The boldness of doing that, and then and then from there, of course, then as that contract was coming to an end, Uriah Heap came to town, and at the time. My favorite songwriter in the world was Ken Hensley. And I just loved how he wrote a rock song. I loved Uriah Heep. I loved how they took m melodies and they made them sound really great. They were like, they were just really poetic and beautiful. And, and he came through and I asked him if he listened to a song and he said, catch me in the bar later. And I waited all night until they came back. And, and that's when they, we met, we had a beer, a few beers together. I gave him my cassette at the time. He went back, he said, he went back to England. He said, I'll call you. And I didn't think nothing of it. Six months later, my phone rang and it was him. And he said, hey, it's Ken Hensley. <laughs> <laughs> Want to move to England and write songs with me and work for Uriah Heat? And that was that. That is crazy. <laughs> Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. I'm John Bowden. This is Rocky Stream Music. Take care of yourself.